I love that combination of stories in Scotland where you have all these, these cultures that have given us this incredible rich uh, s sort of story sources and you can see it in the name places around the country and you've got the Picts and the, and the Scots coming in from the West and the Norse coming in from the East and the Welsh coming from, from uh, uh, settling in some parts in Lower Scotland and so you've got these incredible stories but I, um, I love the stories that, that, um, about the sea and the, the connections between the, these stories that link between Scotland and, and uh, Scandinavia partly I think because I spent a lot of time with Tom Muir from Orkney and um, who you might know and Lauren Sullick and this story is from Yell where Lawrence grew up. Yell is the island. If you know Shetland, you've got the mainland of, El of Shetland. And then just above, there's the island of Yell. And then the next one above that is Unst, which is the highest, you know, the most northerly place in Scotland. And so Yell, and his father was a great storyteller, Tom Tullock. So I got this story not from Lawrence, but from my mother, who got it from Tom directly because my mother's a storyteller so I, I learnt this from my mum but it's, a, it's one of Tom Tullock's stories from Yell. Now there was a lad uh, called Tam on Yell and he was a fisherman and one morning he went down to his boat to go out for a day's fishing and he climbed in and he was getting himself sorted when he realised that something wasn't quite right. There were some things that had been put in a different place than he'd left them the night before. They Somehow they'd been moved. And then he noticed a few knots were tied differently than he would tie them. And the sheets, the, the, the ropes were coiled in a different way. And he thought, oh, somebody's been borrowing my boat. Now, it's sometimes the the uh, other fishermen did borrow boats, um, but usually you would ask before you did. Uh, but then again, nothing was harmed. There was nothing out of place, nothing broken or, or missing. So he forgot about it and went off for a day's fishing. Well, he had great luck that day and he came back with the boat brimming full of fish. And uh, then the next day when he went back to his boat, what do you know? It was obvious once again that somebody had borrowed the boat. But again, nothing was harmed, so he didn't worry about it and away he went fishing. Came back with another amazing catch of fish. But when he went home and he dealt with his fish, instead of going to his bed, he went to the pub. And when he got to the pub, there was all the other fishermen and he asked around, does anyone know who's been borrowing my boat? And they all looked at him and said, Tom, we've not been borrowing your boat. So that was that, he was none the wiser. The next morning, he got to the boat and again, it was obvious that somebody had borrowed it in the night. And well, he went out fishing because there was nothing he could do about it then. And he came back with this huge catch of fish. I mean, the boat was brimming with fish. And so he had loads to take home and deal with. And he got the fish done and he was, he was really pleased. It's hard work though, mind you. But this time he went back to his boat afterwards because he was so curious. He so wanted to know who had been borrowing his boat. So he thought he would lie in wait for whoever they were. He didn't know if they would come back that night and if they did, when it would be. So he found a nice place at the back of the boat with a pile of, uh, of uh, fishing nets and oil skins. And he made himself a nice comfortable seat and he kind of got himself settled in and he waited. Now he must have fallen asleep. And when he opened his eyes, everything had changed because the har, the fog, the mist had come in from the sea. And with that blanket of, of har, you couldn't hear anything, just the slap of the waves gently hitting the shore. And he sat there listening when all of a sudden, there was a sound of crunching of footsteps coming along the shore. 
and he looked and watched me coming through the mist towards him. Along the shoreline, along the beach, were three figures, three men. And they were strange looking. He, he didn't know these folk. He'd never seen them before. And they were wearing weird clothes, quite old fashioned clothes, big hats, they had long ha um, hair and beards. And he was thinking to himself, what are they? Who are they? And he could see the, that they had swords hanging from their, their, um, their belts around their waists and tall boots. And he thought to himself, you know, the last time I saw clothes like that was in the sea chest up in the attic. But his brother and he used to get dressed up and they'd like to pretend to be captains on the high sea or pirates or something. And they would spend hours playing with those clothes. And as these three figures approached him, Tom kind of decided that maybe he wasn't going to confront them. Maybe he would just kind of keep quiet and just see what happened. So he pulls himself back into the shadows. He pulled the, the nets and the oilskins up over him and he lay still. And he waited. Well, he could feel the boat being pushed down into the water and it rocked as the men leapt inside. And then there was the jingle of the rollicks as the oars went into place. And then there was a great pull on the oars. And this great pull made the boat shoot out into the water. And it started to fly through the water. And it flew on and on. It was travelling so fast and it went on for so long till Tam couldn't even figure out how long they were travelling for. And then all of a sudden there was a kind of crunch and they'd hit shore. Well, they felt the boat being pulled up a beach, the men jumping out and then the crunch of footsteps disappearing. Well, Tam thought, OK, I'll have a look now, let's see what's happening. And he came out from his hiding place and it was very different. The, the mist had cleared. Uh, there was no mist. There was a moon, a bright moon. There were thin cloud, clouds, but he could see clearly. And what he saw surprised him because he didn't recognize anything. He'd never been to this place in his life. He didn't recognize the shoreline, the rocks, the, the land in front of him. He'd never seen this place. I thought, how could that be? He knew every coastline, every bit of Shetland, and all the islands and all and places even further away. Where was he? Well, he looked and he could see the three figures headed towards a cliff. And there was like a black kind of hole there. And he worked out, he figured it was a cave. He saw a light being lit and then the sort of swing of a lantern. And then the lantern disappeared into the cave and just got fainter and fainter. Well, Tom wasn't sure what to do. He, he was really keen on exploring this place, but he didn't dare get out the boat. He, he just didn't know what to do. And by the time he had sort of half made up his mind, the light reappeared. And so he slid back into the shadows. He saw the three figures coming towards him again. And this time they were very heavily laden. They had kiss, you know, chests and barrels and bags and boxes and they were just had all this stuff and they were walking very slowly across the beach towards the boat. Well Tam pulled himself back under the nets. The boat rocked, he could hear the clunk of things being thrown into the bottom of the boat. The boat was pushed back into the water, the men jumped in, jingle of the rollicks again and the oars. Away they went into the sea again, and on and on they travelled. Crunch on the land eventually. And um, now up until this point, these men hadn't said a word. But as they started to unload all that cargo, they started to speak to each other. And at first Tam thought that they were speaking a foreign language. He couldn't quite understand, but he sort of recognised it. And then it came to him, it was the old Norn language that they used to speak in Shetland, the old words. And when he was a, a lad, he would go down to the pier 
and his grandfather and the other old fishermen and sailors would be smoking their pipes and telling the stories, you know, all the magic stories. And they'd be using words like that, you know, these words. And so once he realized what it was, he could understand what the men were saying. He remembered those words again. And one of them was saying, oh, you know, it's a real shame that we'll not be able to get any more of our things out of that cave, that this is the last night that we can get things. And another one said, well, you know, thank goodness for Tam's brilliant boat because we managed to get loads. So that's at least something. And then the other one laughed and said, aye, Tam's been very kind to loan, him, loan his boat. We should give him a wee present, a wee gift of appreciation. And then there were grunts and groans as they picked up all the parcels, all the boxes and, and barrels and the crunch of the footsteps disappearing across the sand. Tam peeked out and he could see the three figures. The mist was down again and he could see the three figures walking across the beach. And as he watched, they disappeared into the mist and they were gone as if they'd never been there. Tam got up and he started across the boat and he foot kicked something. He looked down. There were three bottles, old glass, you know, that kind of old thick glass that you get, old ancient bottles covered in barnacles. And he took them home. And you know what? Every single one of them had the finest whiskey that Tam had ever tasted. It was like nectar. It was amazing. And Tam always believed that who he had seen, that they had been ghosts of smugglers from long ago that had come back to get some of their, their stuff that they'd stored, you know, ill-gotten gains. And he spent the rest of his life trying to find that island so he could find the cave, get some more of that whiskey. And he never found it. But he was certainly the luckiest fisherman on Yell. Because no matter the weather, when he went out fishing, he always came back with a boat full of fish. <laughs> what a treat to sit here in this afternoon and get this story. Beautiful, thank you. And the sound of that harp is just leading you far away it's just one note and the mind just swift off thank you Heather. it's a good instrument for telling with stories i yeah. also really like being able to I, I use it a lot to improvise behind other storytellers it's good fun um but um it's um yeah it's it's a great instrument for that so you want to try that with my story well, I was probably going to be cheeky, and if there was anything that happened, I would probably, because I'm bad for that. Okay. <laughs> um, what, what's the name of the mist? Har. 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 Mm. <laughs> I've, I've, Maury Campbell, who uh, I met up in Lismore, I think the first time. No, I actually met her in Portobello, but she has this beautiful place up yeah. in Lismore. Yeah, that's where her family was from. Oh, yeah? Yes. It's a yeah. wonderful place. Yeah. And she told a story once about uh, uh, an old woman at, at Shetland who uh, was knitting in the winter. And then in the summer times, she was uh, walking around in the markets and, and wherever there were people and selling these knittings, you know, and just standing there with the knittings and going like, hey, you want to buy? You want to buy? So she was in a little rowboat and had it going for her and she was just of all around the islands up there you 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 named them the, i don't know the names but i just imagine how this old woman was sort of having a very good time meeting people and being very friendly but one day there was this har this mist she couldn't see a thing when she came out in the ocean and it comes to you i mean the, these mist that just suddenly you can't see anything you're just gone and she was rowing and she was rowing it was it was a long um ride this it, it was she was she was exhausted when she finally and the mist uh, lifted up a little and was cleared like and she could see a shore 
and she came to the shore and she saw there were some people in this little village so she took her things and she went out to the square there and started you know on Shetland I can't do that but I can imagine how she was trying to sell this and people came to her and said what did you hear that? Det är bra, ja, det här ser allt det är väldigt fina saker, men uh, vad mycket kostar det? Pund? Nej, vi, vi, vi har kronor här. And then she realized that she was not in Shetland at all, she was actually in Norway. <laughs> and she was standing in the middle of a square in the village in Norway trying to sell her things. I think, I mean, they, they bought stuff from her and they were quite happy and there was a link there, so. Well, I remember Lawrence telling me once that he was filling in a form for somewhere, and for, you know, for a, a UK form, and they said to put his nearest train station, which was actually in Bergen. <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have the, yeah, it's Fort Williams, right, or something like that. It's down there somewhere. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's further up north from Fort Williams, up from 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 the northern part of the, the the train station that's most northern in Scotland. Oh, there'll be one up up near up at Thurso or something. Oh right, yeah. One way up at the top. No, we're we're still quite far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not as far as yeah, Fort Williams south compared yeah, to. Yeah, it's so far down there. But um, that was my story that was inspired by yours. This little thing with the woman. <laughs> rolling around there with this knitting. Um, the story that I prepared for you uh, is um, the first time I ever tell it. So, I f and, it, and it fits wonderful with a harp. So if you if you in for it, you can you can you can bring in whenever you feel like, well, now it's time to me to improvise Well, we go for it. Once upon a time, there was a town and around the town, there was a wall. To pass that wall, you have to have wings. To get wings, you have to be happy. Purely happy for a whole day. And uh, when it was like the youth, it was like when you were about 18 years old or something like that, they, they gathered all the youth in one day and they should just go around in, the, in this town and be happy for a whole day. And in the evening, the ones who have succeeded in being happy for a whole day had wings on their backs. And so in the act, in the evening sun, they were flying out of this town over the wall, saying goodbye to the moms and their dads, and standing there crying, of course they were. The day before this very, very special day, Jakob was sitting outside his house, and he was sad. I mean, he was supposed to be happy. But he was sad. Next day, if he succeeded, he would walk around in the town being happy the whole day. And then wings were growing on his back. And then in the evening, he would leave everything he, he knew and he loved. His mom, his dad, his neighbor, Janie, who liked to sit next to him in the evening and talk to him. They have done that for years. Also in the three years of the school where they were taught how to be happy, she came out and she sat next to him. Janie, <laughs> with the two holes here when she smiled, <laughs> and her eyes <laughs> tinkling, really beautiful green eyes. He looked at her, and she asked him, "What are you doing, Jakob?" His name was Jakob. "What are you doing, Jakob?" "I'm sitting here." Feeling a little mellow tomorrow, if I'm happy the whole day, I will fly out and I will leave my father and mother in this hometown that I know so well. 
I'm, I'm a little sad about that. You're not supposed to be, she said. You, you're going to be happy the whole day. And then you have wings and then we will fly out. <laughs> you, you, you will fly with me? We, we're not supposed to, you know that. When, when we once are over the wall, we're not, we're not going to see each other again. And then he felt even more sad. But I will miss this, he said. I'd like to sit here and talk to you. And then she got angry. She was like, came up and said, don't do that, Jacob. You ruined the whole thing. You're not going to have wings if you think like that. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Goodbye. And then she walked right into her house. And he walked into his house. His mother and his father were waiting for him. How are you, my boy? Are you all right? Excited for the big day tomorrow? Yeah, I am. But I, but I have a question for you. Well, don't do that. Don't go up and, and, and have a good rest. And tomorrow everything will be perfect. I, we, we, we will have the breakfast ready for you and you will go out in the town and you will be happy. Good night. And he went up and he had a good dream and he woke up in the morning and he went out in the bathroom and he felt very good actually. He was really, he was in a good place. He was happy. And then he looked, wow, what's that on my shoulder? It was like a little something that had grown during, during this just half hour he's been awake because he felt so good. He had a shower and he came out and he had even better time. And then he saw that these wings were going all the way down to his back here. Part of this three years in the school of happiness was to make clothes that fitted for a wing, two wings on the back, right? So he took this whatever it was with two big holes in the back for the wings and he went down there and and his mother was there and she was excited your wings are already growing oh, so lovely perfect morning i mean come on smoothie soft boiled eggs and it was these bread rolls that's not the bread rolls of you mama that's daddy where is he oh oh father is in the garage he's um, working on his motorbike isn't he coming to say goodbye to me no 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 we're all happy we're so happy for you and then he got up and he heard a sound in one of the rooms and there was his daddy. But his daddy looked worried and he asked, what, what, what's this daddy? No, go out, go out and be happy, please, please, son. But I have this question, can I? No, 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 go out in the street and be happy. So he walked out and he spent his whole day there. And every time he was happy, really genuinely happy. His wings unfolded and became bigger. But in a moment he started worrying about, but tomorrow I'm not going to see this place that I love so much. The wings just shrunk and became smaller. And when he saw Janie, he walked straight up to her and said, Hey Janie, hey! Oh, look! They're big! But Janie just said, no, 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 I don't want to talk to you, Jacob, I don't want to talk to you. And she ran away. And then he saw Maria, the other neighbor. She was standing in the middle of the square, looking so sad. She was looking around. And her wings were like small, small, and they became smaller and smaller as he looked. So he just walked away. 
but he felt mellow he felt sad and as he did his wings just became smaller and smaller and then he decided he needed to ask his dad and his mom so he went home and he went into the to the room and they were going oh no because that was in the uh, late afternoon it was time for them to go down to the square they saw that his wings were not big enough to carry him over the wall and they looked at him what is it Jakob what is it I need an answer mom and dad I need that answer and I need it now okay how come that you are here why are you in this town? Why haven't you had wings and just left the town many years ago? What, didn't you didn't you grow wings on your back? Weren't you happy? And his dad just looked at him and said, "Well, we we both had that question in the morning. Why are you here, mom and dad?" to our mom and dad and that's why we're still here and so in the evening in the last sun set they went down to the square Jakob without a wing his mom and dad Janie with big wings that could carry her and they were flying around over the square and all the young ones who had stayed happy for a whole day flew away over the wall. Jacob was looking at his father and mother, well, then I'm going to stay here as well. Yes, said his father, and uh, we invited Maria and her parents to dinner tonight. So uh, if, if you think it's a good idea, we will celebrate or maybe not celebrate, but you're going to stay here and Maria is going to stay here as well. And then, what, what is this? Said Jakob to the parent and the parent just have a smile. Just nothing, nothing, just a dinner. But of course it was not just a dinner. Come on. It was a lovely evening and they sat well in the evening, late, late and talked just like Janie and Jakob used to. And it was great. you sometimes yeah that was an amazing story where, where <laughs> did that come from it well it, it, it's a story that I, I, I if we used it a lot in in the old Swedish Danish uh, company I worked in, in called uh, the storytelling academy where um, we were three um, storytellers two from Sweden and one from Denmark me from Denmark and we used it in the beginning, and I have done it as well here in, in, in Scotland when I do my workshops. I start with this, uh, once upon a time, there was a town around it, there was a wall. To get over the wall, you have to have wings. To get wings, you have to be happy. And that beginning is very uh, good at telling people how to describe how to create images when you tell a story. Because people start, oh, that's a town. I, I know what that means, and, and and a wall. And some of them actually, and then we talk about different walls because all of them have different walls, gray, yellow, or whatever. And that's that's the whole point of, of doing this. Um, and then um, we talk about it. It's very flexible because some some of these uh, the audience have made a wall that's sort of very very low. But in the yeah. moment we say. And to get over that wall, you have to have wings. Then they imagine just go <laughs> and raises the wall. And it's quite amazing that, that, that the mind can do that. So it's been, uh, it's been part of, I think it's Mikael Inde who had done it originally. But this story with Jakob and Janie and Maria came to me as I was walking and preparing myself for this storytelling event with you oh, yesterday. Uh it's a wonderful sort of imagery. I mean, we all have walls and we all, and the choice between do you stay or do you go over the wall? Mm. And, and actually 
is is either you know wh which is what you should do and sometimes staying is the thing you should do and sometimes you should go over the wall and it's just it's a great thing to think through and to see how that's amazing um well i was kind of because a lot of my stories most of the stories that i tell are traveler tales or things because i i spent my childhood growing up listening to all the travelers and folk tales but there is one story that i was thinking that came to mind when you're telling that and it's um, uh, not quite the same idea, but it's still about sort of transformation, if you will. And um, and so I haven't done this. I, it's one that I usually do with the heart, but I haven't done it for ages. And I'm terrible for forgetting what I do one time to the next. When I'm doing workshops for people, I tell them that they should keep a library of information and they should write down everything they do so that they don't forget. And then, of course, I never do that. So we'll see how it goes. But I, I do know the story. It's just... I <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it's a funny thing that, that I'm used to the idea of like bouncing stories off people but when you're doing it live on something like this suddenly the apprehension that I might not think of something just gets you but I but this 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 is quite a good one There was an old man walking through the forest. It was winter time and the forest was very dense, very narrow spaces between the trees that he had to wend his way through. And he was old, I mean really old. He was, his muscles and limbs were all knotted and twisted and his back was bowed over and he had long sort of yellowy scraggly hair and his eyes were yellow and, and he was ancient. And he was having a hard time walking through the forest and it got worse because even though he had a, he had a lantern with him, with a wee bit of candle that was kind of, the light was sort of flickering, but the candle was burning down so he couldn't see much around him but then what should happen but it started to snow and at first it was just sort of gentle flakes coming out of the sky but then the snow got thicker and thicker and faster and faster until it was like a blizzard that was surrounding him just just whiteness and the snow fell so fast that it wasn't long before he was trudging through drifts of it. And as anyone who's walked through snow, you know, you know that it's, it takes a lot of energy to get yourself through those, those drifts of snow. He was using the, the trunks of the trees to pull himself along through the forest. It's still hanging on tightly to that, that lantern, but the light, it was getting lower. And lower, the candle was burning down. He was exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And then suddenly, through the trees, he saw a clearing, and across at the other side of the clearing was a cottage. I th he got new hope, and he started to walk faster across that clearing. As he got to the door, and he crashed into the door and the door burst open and he fell inside just as his candle burnt out. No, the, the more light in the wick. Candle was gone. But he was inside the house and there in the cottage there was an old woman sitting by the fire and she was in a rocking chair and she was rocking in front. She was probably knitting. Probably knitting away and rocking and enjoying the heat of the fire. And she, you know, she was startled when the door burst open and there was this old man. She went over and she picked him up in her arms like a mother picks up her child. And she held him gently and she took him over to the fire. She sat in that rocking chair and she started to rock back. And as she rocked, she started to sing a lullaby. And she rocked him and she sang. 
And she said, there, 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 you're safe with me. And she rocked and she rocked all through the night. As she rocked and the hours passed, that old ancient man turned into a young man with strong limbs, blonde hair, blue eyes. Still she held him, still she rocked him, and still she said, there, there. By morning, it wasn't dawn yet, but it was coming close. That young man had turned into a child with curly blonde locks and bright sparkly blue eyes. And still she sang, still she said, there, there. And then just at the moment of dawn, just before the moment of dawn, she stopped rocking and the child sort of scampered off of her lap and ran across to the door. And then he looked back at her and he gave her a dazzling smile, beautiful smile, and then he turned and he flew up into the sky and he became the morning sun. <laughs> what a beautiful story. Wow, thank you. And, and and you and you found it. <laughs> I found it. I found it. Yes, it was there. It was ready and waiting. So it's amazing how stories do that. They almost tell themselves sometimes. Yeah. They pop back in and go. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the morning sun, being the bright young boy. That's very, 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 very beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for being part of this. Oh, this was fun. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sven. I've really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm really looking forward to going back and catching all the other ones that I've missed. Oh, yeah. I had such a magic chance to see, see some people that um, uh, haven't had the chance. I love that about, I know that there's, there's negative things about what's been happening, but, um, but, you know, I've got a sort of schedule of dashing over to Ireland or other countries for Kayleys all the time. And I feel like I'm sort of traveling the world, uh, getting a chance to interact with musicians and storytellers. And that's quite exciting. And it just keeps us going. We need that. Stories are... <laughs> oh, necessary. And thank you for doing that here, right here in this little room here. So have a good day. Heather, and uh, hope to see you soon yeah, in the so. real world. That would be wonderful. <laughs> that would be lovely. All right. See you and bye. Thank you.